Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the U.S.-China Relations Panel, the opening session of the China Conference here at Harvard Kennedy School, in partnership with the Center for China and Globalization and China U.S. Exchange Foundation. My name is Leo Liu, an MPA candidate here at Harvard Kennedy School. Today, we are graced by the presence of two experts on Sino-American relations from either side of the Pacific who will discuss the state of U.S.-China relations and help us understand its future. Throughout the discussion, if you have a question that you'd like to address to our panelists, please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll relay your questions as we go along. Next, let me introduce our panelists. First, we'll have Professor Graham Allison. Professor Allison is the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government at Harvard University. He was the founding dean of Harvard Kennedy School and until 2017 served as director of this Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs which is ranked as the number one university affiliated think tank in the world. Professor Allison has also served in the key positions in the US government, including as Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration and as Special Advisor to Secretary of Defense under President Reagan. Professor Allison has written many best-selling books on international relations. His latest work is Destined for War, Can America and China Escape to a City Trap? Published in 2017, a topical and important issue that we're going to talk about today. Professor Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Next, we have Dr. Wang Huiyao. Dr. Wang is the founder and president of Center for China and Globalization, a leading Chinese non-governmental think tank that ranked among top 80 think tanks in the world. Dr. Wang is also an advisor to the Chinese government, having been appointed as counselor for China State Council by the Chinese premier in 2015. Dr. Wang is the thought leader on China and globalization, global governance, global trade and investment, global migration and talent flows, China's international relations, and China-U.S. trade relations. Dr. Wang, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. So let's begin. This year is the 50th anniversary of Nixon's visit to China. It was a watershed moment in history which marked the beginning of the normalization of relations between the US and China after over 20 years of mutual hostility. In those 50 years, the Cold War has ended, the world economy has grown 21 fold from less than $4 trillion to $85 trillion in 2020. The US has helped China join the WTO. China has developed from an back economically backward country to become the second largest economy in the world and in the process, lifting 8,800 8, million people out of poverty. And the two countries have enjoyed a relatively peaceful relationship. As we commemorate this historical event, I would like to ask both Professor Allison and Dr. Wang, what was the significance of Nixon's visit to China? How should we look at it today? Well, I will take a shot and then uh, Secret Henry says uh, that it's a pleasure to be uh, on a panel with them. We're colleagues and friends from many different occasions. Now for, for me, this is pretty poignant. Uh, this month is a 50th anniversary uh, because uh, I was a student and remain a student and colleague now of Henry Kissinger, who actually had or orchestrated this visit of Nixon to uh, China 50 years ago this month. And uh, I've talked to him about it often after. So this was advertised by the Nixon administration as the quote, week that shook the world. And they were recalling Napoleon's uh, council in which he said, let China sleep because when it awakes, it will shake the world. So I would say Napoleon was correct. China has awakened, it has shaken, and the world is still shaking with more to come. And interestingly, uh, in the final year of his life, uh, as I describe in my Destined for War book, Nixon came to have some second thoughts, just wondering, you know, what had I done? And he said, you know, was it possible that we awakened Frankenstein's monster? that we've created something that's going to be bigger and uh, perhaps even hostile to us. So he was thinking about that question. And I think that uh, it's very appropriate for 
uh, in a setting like this to try to think back on the 50 years, to note what remarkable things have happened over those years for the world's benefit, for China's benefit, for America's benefit, but to also notice that uh, that was then and this is now. Dr. Wong? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Leo. And, and it's great to see Graham again. <laughs> you are such a, a great thought leader, uh, uh, you know, in, in the co contemporary China-US relation and, and also geopolitics. So, so glad to see you again. <laughs> also, uh, uh, my professor uh, a number of years ago. So, so I think that uh, uh, what uh, Graham said is really, uh, 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 you know, a great uh, recall of this historical uh, <laughs> Uh, a landmark event actually happened uh, exactly 50 years ago. And I think that, uh, that the impact still being felt. I mean, that uh, we have led uh, uh, to a half a century, uh, global uh, you know, normalization, globalization, and prosperity. And I think now in China, I mean, just last week, you know, there was a big celebration of Shanghai Communique, which has been established for the last 50 years. So, so I think this is really important and uh, it's a really a, a great uh, uh, event that uh, uh, we go down history that uh, uh, you know sailed uh, uh, you know stability and the prosperity for the last half century. So, so what I what I think the wisdom of uh, uh, you know Nixon and the Kissinger uh, half a century ago should probably be revisited. Now uh, uh, you know we have this crisis at Ukraine, and uh, uh, so so I hope that. Uh, uh, people can see that China actually for the last half a century is very largely uh, uh, contributed to the global stability and prosperity. It become the second largest uh, uh, trade nation in the world, uh, uh, second largest economy in the world and the largest trading nation in the world. And I think there's many things that uh, uh, China, US uh, can continue the spirit of uh, Shanghai Communique and also, uh, you know, to really uh, be uh, more uh, a, a, a bit normal situation than we're currently in, which I think we are having a, quite a bit uh, challenges and uh, difficulties now. Yeah, just following up on uh, Dr. Wong's point, I think many would say the Shanghai Communique was one of the lasting legacies of Nixon's visits, which really laid out some core principles for US-China engagement and touched on many issues such as Taiwan, but also on Vietnam, India, Japan, and the Korean Peninsula. Do you think that these principles are still relevant today? Let me begin with Dr. Wang. Well, I think that the, the principles are still relevant today, highly relevant. I mean, for example, in the Shanghai Communique, it said, uh, you know, we, we should uh, seek the, the, the peace and security of, uh, of the uh, Pacific region. And uh, also that, uh, you know, uh, in Taiwan, actually, both both uh, US and China recognize there's a, there is a, uh, there is a, you know, uh, uh, Taiwan is a part of China, basically. And uh, so, so, so those are really key fundamental principles. And also, uh, they were actually, uh, you, know, not, you know, seeking not actually to inf interfere or actually uh, uh, disrupt the, 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 the region, because I think US and China has a great uh, responsibility for that. So I think the Shanghai Communique uh, is still quite, uh, you know, uh, still very relevant today. I mean, basically has laid a foundation for the peace and security for the last uh, half a century, I, I suppose. And I think uh, that uh, we have to continue some of that uh, uh, fundamental principles. But I think we can, of course, uh, upgrade. I mean, we could have a, 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 another sign of US communicate based on the past three communiques, I think. But still, I think we should really respect, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Shanghai communique and subsequently two communique we had with, between China and the US. So I, I'm, I largely agree with uh, Dr. Wong. I think uh, the Shanghai Communique identified some uh, fundamental uh, uh, foundations for the establishment of relations between the US and China. And they were largely a reiteration of the foundations, the foundational concepts in the UN Charter that China continues repeating, but they deserve to be repeated. They are called sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, non-interference in internal affairs. These are principles that the UN Charter 
uh, laid down, but that are reflected in the Shanghai Communique. The biggest ad in terms of the relationship between China and the U.S. was the proposition that there's one China, that the parties on both sides of the strait agree on that proposition, and that ultimately, as we saw then with normalization of relations, that Beijing is the capital of that China. Uh, I think the difficulty has been that as the as the decades have gone on, and the circumstances have changed in China, and the circumstances have changed in Taiwan, and the circumstances have changed to some extent in the U.S. and the world. Uh, the Shanghai Communique needs to be substantially uh, upgraded uh, and revised. And I would say that would be a great undertaking for the Biden and Xi administration going forward. And I don't think it's simply enough to restate what the Shanghai Communique stated, but to try to take account of the new realities in all three countries. Thank you, Professor. So many people in the West, uh, including pundits and academics, have described the current state of Sino-American relationship, as Professor Allison has mentioned, it has changed as the beginning of a new Cold War. While the Chinese media has generally refrained from such narrative and the Chinese government has actively rejected this so-called Cold War mentality, do you think that this new Cold War characterization is accurate? Let me begin with Professor Allison. Well, the answer is, uh, unfortunately, I'm a, pro a professor, so it's complicated. Okay? And the answer is yes and no. Okay? But if I had to choose just one, I would say no. Uh, so let me explain briefly. Uh, is the relationship between the U.S. and China a rivalry, a rivalry that's basically captured, I think, appropriately by Thucydides in his description of what happens in a competition between two states when the seesaw of power on which they're sitting is rapidly shifting. So that initially I'm competing with you in which I look down on you or up on you, depending on where the seesaw is. And all of a sudden it's moving at the same time. So this Thucydides and rivalry I describe in the book, I think that's the best diagnosis of the problem that we face. So I take that to be the reality of the situation. But at the same time, the US and China uh, live on a small planet in which both have superpower nuclear arsenals and in which both emit greenhouse gases into the same constrained biosphere and therefore in which either of them by themselves can ruin the world for both itself and the other. So we're basically uh, inseparable conjoined Siamese twins, if you want to give sort of a metaphor. And however, uh, uh, however uh, hostile I may feel towards my competitor, however deserving he may be of being strangled, if I were to ever uh, a yield to this temptation and one strangled the other, it would be committing suicide at the same time. So you look at that and you say, hmm, I have a vital national interest in my survival, which requires my finding a way to coexist with you, even while at the same time, I'm engaged in a fierce rivalry with you. So I would say that's the description of our problem and the reason why uh, it's quite different from the Cold War because the idea that there might be a new economic iron curtain 
in which the U.S. is on one side and everybody else will join the U.S. and China is on the other side makes no sense since China is the major trading partner of everybody. China is a backbone of the global economy. So while there are some similarities between the competition in between US and China, uh, similarities with what we experienced in the Cold War, the differences are also huge, in particular, the economic difference. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Yes, I, I agree with uh, Graham. I think that uh, probably we can't uh, categorize this as a, a cold war. I, I really uh, remember well last year around the same time, uh, at this time, we, we had a dialogue with, uh, with Graham and he has put forward his famous, uh, you know, inseparable conjoined twins. Uh, that is really, I think, a, a great phrase to reflect uh, the reality. I noticed that uh, Prime Minister of Singapore actually cited your, your, your this phrase uh, in the New Economy Conference uh, just just last November. So, so I think it's it, it's true. You know, uh, I, I think when you say Cold War at that time, when we mainly mean Soviet Union uh, against uh, you know Eastern Bloc of countries and and and, and Western Bloc countries, but then the economic, the, the people to people exchanges, uh, tourism, student exchanges. For example, during the Cold War, there's no student from China study. In the U.S. now you have, uh, you know, uh, half a million uh, almost uh, study there. So, so, so the tourism, the the, the economic uh, scale, the trade volume, it's it's this world is totally uh, connected. Uh, so, so somehow, of course, there there's some decoupling on the on the tech side, but even that I think is hurting the consumers, hurting the uh, business, and hurting the country. So, so, so we, we don't know. I mean, we have to see uh, how that going to uh, partial uh, decoupling is, is going to survive, but, but we really hope uh, that uh, we need to strengthen the global governance and then uh, US and China and EU, maybe you can find a way to work together and then really uh, to have a, a normal acceptance of each other and that we can ma make this world uh, a much uh, uh, you know, a better place uh, for, for the 7.9 billion people in this world. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And I actually, I, I want to follow up on both of your descriptions of the U.S.-China relations as inseparable conjoined twins. But meanwhile, as Dr. Wong has just mentioned, the two countries have begun to decouple in some respects, like American companies pulling out of China in recent years. So in your opinion, to what extent are the countries separable? In what aspects can they separate? And to what extent are they not? Let me begin with Professor Allison. So the term decoupling uh, kind of resonates. And when uh, Trump began to talk about it, the press actually you know, amplifies it. But if you look at the reality, uh, the trade between the US and China is thicker now than it was before we started decoupling. So in spite of, in fact, the trade war, we're back to the level of trade that we had before the trade, before the war. Part of the reason for that is that uh, Americans are uh, consumers and China is the world's most successful producer of consumer goods. So where are iPhones assembled? In China. Uh, where do batteries for electronic vehicles come from? from China, or the elements from China, where we could go on down the list. So basically, the uh, economic relationship has continued to thicken at the same time that there's been this pushback in certain areas. And there's some items, particularly advanced semiconductors, that the Trump administration uh, denied China that have had a big impact on some industries in China, though China is developing the capacity to manufacture its own semiconductors for most of the categories, not just the most advanced. But, but uh, so I think that we'll end up with uh, efforts to decouple certain arenas, or I would say to put a security fence around some items that have 
military or security applications, but those are very few. And then we'll have a lot of protectionism, which is what you can currently see unleashed in a good part, unfortunately, of the Biden Build Back Better program. And if you listen to the State of the Union speech last night, where the effort to uh, manufacture things in the US that China can actually manufacture uh, at half the price or two thirds the price uh, will simply mean paying more for the equivalent items. So figuring out a way in which the uh, comparative advantages of the US in goods and services we can produce can complement the comparative advantages of China, which include essentially uh, uh, dominance in manufacturing uh, commodity products. Not only that, but at least that, but those happen to be the things that end up filling up Walmarts and Target and uh, Home Depot and finding a way then to <clears throat> deal with what's inevitably been a trade deficit, uh, that's a challenging item, and especially challenging in the politics of the, of the two countries, and especially for the US. But I think going forward, because in the security arena, for sure, China and the US are conjoined Siamese twins, whom if they were ever to have a nuclear war, would destroy each other. For sure, I would say in the climate space, unless they can find a way to constrain greenhouse gas emissions, they will both spoil the biosphere for both of us. And I think even in the economic arena, there's some analog of that, that we have yet to kind of work our way through. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Wong? Yes, uh, uh, I think that uh, the grammar actually is, is correct. And, uh, you know, many areas you, you, you cannot really separate decouple. And uh, uh, some decoupled area is really probably driven by, by these geopolitical uh, concerns uh, of both sides, probably. But I can see, actually, you know, if we work together, we, we make, uh, uh, you know, the win win. For example, the two largest company in the United States, like Apple. I mean, 90% of Apple phone was made in China, but it was, you know, designed and the brand by, by uh, technology provided by Apple. So that is good, a success story that China, U United States work on the Apple phone, supply the rest of the world. And also Tesla, I mean, almost become the largest company in the world because they have the largest uh, clean uh, vehicle manufacturer here in Shanghai. So, so you see, that is really good examples how we can work together. With, uh, with this, uh, you know, cooperation. Uh, but again, uh, uh, I can see now we're ha having really difficult time because uh, the US administration has actually put hundreds of Chinese companies, I mean, close to 700 now <laughs> to some kind of a entity or other uh, watchable uh, list. So, so that is really where that is hurting. I think uh, we just had a, 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 a book launched uh, about a week ago on how multinationals, international chambers view this. I mean, they felt, you know, that was really uh, not help, particularly from multinational point of view. So I think, you know, how we can really, the business community can, can uh, you know, help this out because, you know, surveys again, like recently the Economist uh, Intelligence Union has just had an event that was at, uh, speaking there. Then they had actually all the, company 14500 most company in the asia pacific is continue to invest continue to uh, look look uh, you know positively to this region and then china's import export investment all bought break record last year so so you see i mean still i, I see there is a forces trying to decouple but of course there's also much larger positive forces wants to uh, conjoin I, I think that is really uh, we have to be careful now with this political crisis i think there's even more so we want to stabilize, have a stabilized China, have a stabilized supply and cooperation with the rest of the world, particularly US, United States. Thank you, Dr. Wang. I think those are all great points. And you've both mentioned both um, competition as well as cooperation. 
So I think technological competition has become one of the centerpieces of US-China engagement. But as Dr. Wang has just mentioned, when governments adopt protectionist policies, it is ultimately the consumers who bear the cost. How can the US and China engage in the tax race without harming the consumers in both countries? Let me begin with Professor Ellison again. Well, good, difficult question, so thank you. So, the, excuse me one second. <coughs> we just rep repeated, uh, concluded a report of our China working group at Harvard called the Great Technology Rivalry. And what this does is, is one of five reports on the great rivalry, which try to track the data on what's actually happened in the 21st century, just the last 21 years in the rivalry between the US and China. And the bottom line for each of these chapters and in particular for the technology report is that a country that the US could not even find in our rearview mirror 21 years ago, because it was so far behind, we can't find in our rearview mirror today because it's either beside us or slightly ahead of us. So we look at six, we look across the spectrum of technology, but then drill down on six frontier technologies, 5G, AI, quantum, synthetic biology. So you can look at this report. It's on the Belfer website. Uh, uh, it's about 60 pages with a lot of footnotes and data. And basically what it shows is that uh, China has made huge leaps forward in becoming a serious rival in almost every technological arena. So 5G is a particularly uh, difficult, a painful one for me. And I wrote a piece about it in the Wall Street Journal with Eric Schmidt a couple of weeks ago. So basically the short version of the story is 3G was dominated by Europe. 4G, the US rail rolled out and created an environment in which then it was possible for people to invent things, which we now think of as mobile and smartphones and social media and a bunch of Google Maps, Uber, lots of things that nobody could have even imagined before. You know, when it was 3G or well, 5G, the US advertises 5G, uh, you cannot watch the football playoff games or anything else without being inundated, as you know. But actually, the service providers, this is a fake. I mean, the title of our article was America's 5G deserves five Fs. And we do a comparison with China. And I say, you know, if you buy a Apple smartphone that's, that's 5G enabled, the only reason why that would be valuable to have in most of the US would be if you were gonna to go to the Olympics, to Beijing, where you would be able to downstream at five times 4G speeds. Whereas here, 5G has the same speeds as 4G, sometimes even slower. So this is a case where no blame for China, good for China doing what it did and doing it successfully, Blame for US for not running faster and finding a way to do so. And so that's uh, you know, a struggle. Now, competition, uh, competition is at least in economics, a good thing. Competition in Olympics and athletics is a good thing. I run faster if I'm running against somebody, if I have a, a competitor than I do when running alone. So how then to recognize the win-win component of uh, constructive competition and but none if, nonetheless at the same time recognize that at the end of the day, the party that that wins the race, for example in 5G will, have advantages 
economically and in security terms in their rivalry with the other uh, competitor. So this is back to this contradiction again, that on the one hand, the competition can be constructive and positive and have benefits. At the same time, in a geopolitical rivalry where I would rather the rules for the internet be written by the US and my Chinese colleague might prefer them to be written by China. That's the competitive side of it. And I think we will have to be smart enough to hold these two contradictory impulses in our heads and in our, in our guts at the same time and still function. Thank you, Professor Allison. Dr. Wong? Yes, yes, uh, I, I uh, very much agree with what uh, uh, Graham has just said. I think this, uh, uh, this Olympic spirit, this, this uh, athletic uh, uh, competition, which is healthy, uh, absolutely, you, you, you run with somebody, you probably help you run faster. So that is a healthy competition. We, we, we really want to uh, avoid this uh, un unhealthy competition. So I think Graham mentioned about 5G and, and those things. So because I think China was, uh, was probably in some case competing with US and uh, uh, EU. Now China, for example, they build 4.6 4G stations. Now they have 1.4 million 5G stations. Well, every village now is, is Wi-Fi connected. So that, that's really, uh, really helped the efficiency and the effectiveness of, uh, of production and manufacturing and, and the whole society running in China. So I, think, so I think infrastructure is really a great thing. I, I noticed that Graham's uh, book, uh, the latest report on technology also mentioned about infrastructure. For example, China's uh, uh, speed railway is, have two thirds of the global total length. Which is enormous, and uh, so, okay. so I'm, I'm the thinking, US, yeah. US has zero. <laughs> <laughs> we <Okay>. have zero. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, uh, but but so 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 what what I was thinking is that uh, uh, you know uh, President Biden actually proposed you know the infrastructure package of one point two trillion uh, in the B three W Build Back Better World, and the uh, EU has proposed the three hundred billion euro on infrastructure, and China has the this infrastructure for, for, for the last eight years on Belt and Road connectivity. So maybe we could, you know, on this uh, common thing that uh, common prosperity, we can work together with the uh, uh, US and the EU on the infrastructure so that we can really, uh, 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 really intertwine the, deeply so we can avoid the future conflict. So something like that, infrastructure. I had a talk with uh, Larry Summers about uh, a month ago, we talked about in length. He was thinking about the World Bank should be re Revigorated and uh, ADB, AIB, and all the development banks should really work together for the uh, probably we have another infrastructure transformation for the world, which is bad and needed. I think, you know, we need to find a common ground to work with each other. Thank if you, Dr. Can, if I can make one to have, yes. have frivolous comment. So uh, I'm uh, enamored of uh, China's uh, prowess in constructing infrastructure. And I'm appalled by American uh, efforts. And if you wanna get a vivid example of this, look at my TED talk uh, that was from 2017, uh, in which I compare uh, how long it took to, to renovate the Harvard Bridge between the Kennedy School and the Business School across the river on the one hand and the Sun Yun Bridge in Beijing, which has twice the number of lanes of traffic. And you won't believe the answer, but I've got a timestamp video of the Chinese construction project, a project uh, how many, how long did it take before the traffic was flowing as compared to the Harvard one. So that's just for fun. And I would say, secondly, when Xi Jinping came to visit uh, Donald Trump for his first visit at Mary Lago, I made a proposal first to the uh, Chinese who didn't seem to like it, the idea, and then to Trump's crowd, they didn't like the idea either. So finally I said, well, it's probably tongue in cheek I'll make it publicly. So I think I wrote a Time Magazine piece about it. 
So I said, you know, in the Chinese tradition, when the when the leader comes to visit, they bring presents. So oftentimes when they go to an African country, for example, they'll build a soccer stadium or something, you know, something to be to just a, a significant uh, uh, sign of appreciation. I said, well, Donald Trump was very keen about having a wall that would prevent illegal immigration from Mexico. So my proposal was that she would say to Trump, you know, uh, China likes walls. Uh, China actually has a long history with walls. We're very proud of one. We call it the Great Wall. So <laughs> if you would like, we can construct a, a Great Wall for you right along the border with, with Mexico. I said, if they would do that, uh, he would have Donald Trump as his closest but <laughs> <laughs> that's a great anecdote. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Allison. So actually, uh, that's a great segue to our uh, to my next question, which is on infrastructure. Both the U.S. and China are pursuing infrastructure development. For the Biden administration, it's built back better. For China, it has continued to develop its infrastructure domestically, but also try to export it worldwide through its Belt and Road Initiative. Do you think that the U.S. and China have opportunities to collaborate on infrastructure development? This time, let me begin with Dr. Wang. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, uh, the Graham's anecdote is really, uh, 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 you know, exemplified the, the need. I think there's complementary uh, role that can can be played. Uh, for example, I can give you a, a, a story, a case that I, I was uh, uh, speaking at the Council of Foreign Relations a few years back, and I was saying that. Uh, you know, the, 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 the taxes, the, the oil, you know, the energy from taxes, the inland, uh, the cost of that uh, to the shore, uh, export that on, on, on ocean to China, is double the cost, inland cost is double the cost of the ocean <coughs> shipping cost. Why? Because there's no <laughs> infrastructure inland. And, and actually, Michael Pillsbury was on, 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 on at, the, at the meeting, and he actually uh, went back and verified that. That was true, because there's no infrastructure in the inland taxes to really uh, take a big advantage of this energy export. So, so I think that uh, it's important that we actually have uh, uh, infrastructure. I think, uh, as Graham said, there's, there's zero uh, uh, you know, high-speed rail. Maybe we could help uh, San Francisco to uh, Los Angeles or, or Las Vegas to, to, to Los Angeles. You know, there could be a short way of doing that. Absolutely, and also airports and uh, uh, infrastructure uh, I, I think there's, a, there, you know, we could probably start by having those helping U.S. export to China uh, infrastructure, like like I mentioned the taxes. So so, but also we have uh, China has, uh, uh, you know, there's some uh, underground company doing some project in in, in Houston, uh, no, in uh, also in Boston and <laughs> Los Angeles. Uh, so so I think there there could be a way of doing that. Uh, absolutely, but I think I, I see the big potential though is actually working in a third country. In a developed country where the U.S. has all the tradition, familiar with the religion and, and, and language and, the, and laws and everything, China has all the capacity built up uh, in the last several decades in, in big mega project. So I think they can really work together uh, for, for, for both uh, you know, each other and for the world. I, I think there's a lot of potential to do. So, so how to have a global governance for that? I mean, World Bank, I mean, chaired by U.S., uh, Asian Development Bank chaired by uh, Japanese, and AIB chaired by China, maybe the development banks should start first uh, because AIB also joined by many European uh, countries. And that's a good vehicle to really start uh, working on the infrastructure. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Professor Allison? Well, I, I like uh, Henry's thoughts. I, I have, I think part of the problem is that uh, there are probably seven reasons why American infrastructure projects have been uh, so slow and unsuccessful. And therefore, doing them in a cooperative or joint way with China is not necessarily going to make those better. Okay. So I'm, I'm, uh, when I look at the effort to build a high speed rail. We have one project. It was supposed to go from Sacramento to from, from LA to Sacramento. Uh, the governor 
couple of weeks ago. It started out, they were going to be finished in five years. So it costs, I think, $40 billion or 50. Uh, it's now 15 or 17 years later. They're not saying whenever it's going to be finished, if ever. And it has a $110 billion uh, budget, so it hasn't been completed. Uh, now, we'd take a long analysis to see what are all the things that are wrong with it. But if I try to pick up on Henry's point, maybe a silver lining would be, so could you imagine, so Elon Musk thinks he can do virtually anything. He's got one of these crazy ideas of boring holes underground, you know, through which you would run either cars or trains and stuff. I don't know whether it makes any sense or not, but I can imagine him having a company which had both a Chinese and an American, you know, component and then going and whatever, drilling a hole from Los Angeles to Sacramento or from wherever to wherever. Uh, uh, so I think the idea of maybe having some business people in the mix uh, with companies, uh, they're more, more pragmatic than the governments. And uh, they basically, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So, uh, but I think it's going to be a difficult area because it's an area in which American performance has uh, been poor. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Allison. So I want to sh shift gears a little bit to the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. You know, the, over the past week, the whole world's attention has been fixated on Ukraine. And uh, as Russia invaded, the U United States, as well as most of the U uh, European nations have joined to condemn Putin for this act of war. Sure. But uh, uh, China has generally maintained its neutrality on this issue. So what do you think are the implications that this, this uh, Russian-Ukraine conflict might have on US, China, and U Ru uh, Russia-China relations? Let me begin with Professor Allison. Okay, so again, this is another big subject that I could, uh, one of the problems about professors is that, as one of my colleagues said, they speak in 50 minute sound bites. So, so I'll try to be, be brief. Uh, I wrote a piece, so I've written two pieces in the last two weeks about this for anybody who wants to read at greater length. So they were both in the national interest the most recent one was last week in which I said uh, or raised the question, will China have Putin's back in this invasion? And I said, my prediction is the answer is yes. Okay? The previous piece a couple of weeks ago said uh, Washington was saying Putin's invasion was imminent and it was going to happen tomorrow or Biden once said, uh, told the leaders of Europe, that it's going to be on Wednesday. And I said, there's going to be no invasion of Ukraine before February 20. Uh, and I was making, taking four to one bets, four dollars of my money against a dollar of yours, uh, with Washington people on this. I'm going to be in Washington tomorrow collecting some of my bets. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So basically, the fundamental reason why there was not going to be an invasion before the closing ceremony of the Olympics is that she and China have built a relationship with Putin and Russia that is thick and operational. And even though it defies geopolitical gravity, since in principle, if you were just a Martian analyst, you would say China and Russia have many more reasons to be adversarial than to be allied. They have a lot of territory that used to be called China that's now called Russia, <laughs> including a port that the Russians call Vladivostok, but on Chinese maps still have a Chinese name. Okay? They have uh, a huge area in Siberia that has no people virtually 
and is full of resources. On the other side of a border, you have a huge hundreds of millions of people and no oil and gas or other resources. So I can think of a solution to that problem. So then you go through this, you go through the list and you say, how can the world can two states that should naturally be antagonistic be as operationally uh, aligned as they are? And I'd say there's two big factors. First is uh, uh, Xi, China's brilliant diplomacy, especially Xi's, uh, in uh, finding a way to court and coddle Putin, and even to make him feel comfortable as a junior partner without ever saying so. So who was the first person she visited when he became president? Putin. Whom did he spend his birthday, their birthday with? Putin. Who was the person, who's the first person that pops up at every Chinese meeting after, after she? Putin. Who's the first person he met with in person for two years, or foreign leader? There at the summit at the beginning of the, of the Olympics, February 4, Putin. So she has done a great job of that. And secondly, the U.S. has in uh, targeting both China and Russia as adversaries uh, and trying to isolate the two of them has missed the fact that the enemy of my enemy is a friend. That's geopolitics 101. So as Spig Brzezinski pointed out, we've been pushing China and Russia closer together. Well, this is just the opposite of the trilateral diplomacy that we're remembering the 50th anniversary of now. So this is like, she has learned the lesson better than Americans have. So I would say that uh, uh, as we watch what's now happening, uh, China is stressed because what Russia is doing is blatantly contradicts China's fundamental principles for international relations. But China not only says, but I think the Chinese government believes in the foundations of the UN Charter, including sovereignty and territorial integrity. No one can deny that Russia's invasion uh, coming on the heels of it previously uh, seizing Ukraine, sorry, say seizing Crimea is not consistent with territorial integrity. So that's made the job of the foreign ministry very, very difficult. And you could have seen them been trying to figure out some, you know, some path here. But at the same time, I argue in this piece that uh, given China's interests and it, uh, that where it has to make hard choices, it will have uh, Putin's back. And so far, I think that's what we're observing. Now, one last point. I was uh, interested that yesterday, Wang Yi, the foreign minister, had a conversation with the Ukrainian foreign minister, in which according to the foreign ministry's account of the conversation, he said China was eager to play a role in helping to negotiate a ceasefire now and a resolution of these issues in which uh, Ukraine would be a neutral state. So I think it's likely that we'll see more activity from China trying to play a role as a, uh, as a peacemaker in this space, because that way that'll soften the fact that at the same time, it's protecting Putin's back, including in the vote today in the UN, in which it abstained rather than uh, criticizing Russia for invading Ukraine. Thank you, Professor Allison, for those great remarks. Uh, Dr. Wang, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Graham has uh, certainly uh, uh, made a, a case that I think 
historically, China and Russia has has a lot of uh, difficulties, and 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 Russia has taken big chunk of. Uh, uh, Chinese territories uh, in, in in a historical sense, but I, even as myself, I I remember in the late nineteen uh, sixties, we almost uh, broke a war out with Russian, with the uh, former Soviet Union. So it was really uh, a, a, a relationship up and down. But I think recent years, uh, the relationship has, has become very very well. But I think that's probably also reflecting the, uh, the what the Graham just said. I was actually pushed probably by uh, U.S. and by Western countries that uh, that they too get uh, a bit closer because they, I think they share some kind of empathy to each other because they, they all feel the, the sanctions and things like that. But what I what I think actually is though that China is different with Russia. But you remember when the last October when President Biden came to Beijing, uh, no, he had a virtual summit with President Xi. Was really uh, uh, you know very encouraging words that he's saying you know the U.S. is not seeking to change China. U.S. does not want to set up alliance against China. So the moment Biden goes back to Washington and said, okay, we're going to boycott the Olympics. And so it's a really big shock, surprise to the Chinese government and to its people. But then Putin comes out, say, okay, I'm going to come to the Beijing Olympic. I'm going to support Beijing. I'm going to come uh, in, in a big way. And uh, so that's where he came and they, they, they have the big uh, uh, John statement. But that statement, you know, I think there's a misunderstanding. It was, should not be in, interpreted as 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 common kind of alliance. China does not seek alliance with any other countries. It's not a military alliance. Uh, they just boldly uh, laid out some of the their views of the world, how the global governance, how how they can cooperate, and 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 things like that. So so I think it's a bit overread of that uh, uh, statement. But but again, as uh, uh, Graham said, uh, we had the uh, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, had uh, just had a. Uh, uh, you know, telephone call with the foreign minister of Ukraine, and then China stated very clear that uh, U Ukraine sovereignty, uh, you know, should be respected, uh, as also Mr. Wang Yi said at the Munich Security Conference. So I think absolutely, you know, it, it would be great. I think China can, can do something because uh, uh, China, if you look at a country that has both good relations with Ukraine and the Russian, you probably wouldn't find the second most influential country in the world to have that position. So China could use that position because China also has a vital interest with European countries. Ukraine is a signing party to the Belt and Road Initiative. China has a 16 plus one initiative. The, the continental, you know, speed rail, uh, the train cargo actually uh, has gone up 50 times for China uh, and Euro European uh, continental uh, train uh, shipment. So, so there's vital interest for China to see the security and and the prosperity in Europe as well. So, uh, and also China is the largest trading partner uh, with Europe as as, as well. So, uh, again, I I think it would be great uh, if uh, if China is invited to the table and then uh, use its uh, good uh, goodwill to really make sure this uh, conflict is not escalated and de-escalate that. And China certainly can can play much role there. Thank you, Dr. Wang. I think the Ukrainian crisis has certainly shown us that even though that both U.S. and China are third parties, they can't really avoid each other in a globalized world. So I think touching, going, going, still following up on the global issues, there are many other global issues such as climate change, pandemics, and nuclear non-proliferation that require collaboration from both countries. Can the two countries find ways to collaborate in, sp in spite of substantial differences? Professor Allison? Well, I would say uh, survival is a very powerful, uh, uh, sturdy uh, uh, imperative. Nations rarely are leaders, sane leaders of nations rarely commit suicide for their country. You can probably find some examples, but it's a very, very, very rare. So if sane leaders of China and the US, and I think we have quite sane leaders in both Biden and Xi, uh, look at the world and say, what's happening if there should be a nuclear war between the two of us? They quickly get to the right conclusion. Bad idea. <laughs> If they look at the climate challenge over the long run, they can see that 
either party by itself on the current trajectory can emit so much greenhouse gas that the whole biosphere will become unlivable for everybody. So bad idea. Pandemics, interesting. So the prospect of having impermeable walls around the country uh, to prevent a hundred percent of the penetration by viruses losing battle. That doesn't mean that the Chinese strategy for trying to find cases when they occur and and limit their spread. Actually, it's turned out to have been, I would say, more certainly more successful than the American strategy. But it still is not a, a zero world. Pandemic or uh, viruses and bacteria will get through borders. But they don't. They don't observe border. So again, shared interest in trying to prevent that uh, or find ways to deal with it. And I think in the uh, nuclear proliferation, we're seeing this with the Iranian negotiations that are going on right now. I have an interest in Iran becoming a nuclear weapon state. So what can they do? Uh, so I think there are many areas like that that should motivate two rational countries to find ways to cooperate in spite of the fact that we'll be competitive at the same time. Thank you, Professor Allison. Dr. Wang? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with Graham. I think that uh, important that uh, being the largest and the second largest economy in the world, and also with the increasing influence, I mean, all those global challenges, we need a global leadership and global, uh, you know, global multilateralism to, to, to really thrive. So, so I think it's important that uh, now the U.S. is running thing on many of those uh, global uh, governance issues and China could really help and, uh, su you know, be supportive. I, I really think those are common uh, area like climate change, like the cyber security and also, uh, you know, all the other infrastructure needs of the world and things like that, poverty alleviation, SDG 2030 agenda. I mean, it's really need a lot of common, uh, common efforts. And, and then, but most important, leadership. So I think China and the U.S. has a moral responsibility uh, to really to, to work on that. And, uh, and then so that we can really get away from this geopolitical attention somewhat and put more emphasis on the, uh, you know, on those common prosperity, common good for the world, and then really, that is really important. I, 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 I think we should work towards that. And that's really, I, I think I'm really uh, encouraged by the dialogue we have today. Thank you, Dr. Wang. I know that our time is almost up, but I just have one last question. What are, what are your hopes for the next 50 years of U.S. and China relations since we have commemorated the past 50 years in the beginning of this webinar? Let me begin with Professor Allison. Well, I don't think anybody would have imagined 50 years ago uh, the China that exists today. Uh, if you had told Kissinger and Nixon that uh, uh, China would have become a full-scale peer competitor of the U.S. in one of their lifetimes, they would have said, you're out of, out of your mind. Okay. Not conceivable. So what China has accomplished in just basically two generations is quite amazing. And I think, uh, I and expect that the next 50 years will be equally amazing, you know, for China, for the US and for, for the world. So I think the main task for both the US and China, uh, in my view, is to find a way to escape Thucydides' trap. So we should study history carefully and recognize that even though there were a lot of benefits to uh, Germany and Great Britain in the period from, oh, I don't know, the 1880s right through to 1914, and even though they were both each other's most important trading partner. They were both uh, heavily invested in each other. Uh, they both uh, 
exchanged a lot of students who were educated in the other country. Actually, the two leaders of the country were cousins, okay? So they were relatives and they celebrated uh, holidays together. Nonetheless, when you have a rising power seriously threatening to displace a ruling power, uh, you find a syndrome that we've seen repeatedly in history since Athens rose to challenge Sparta. And mostly those turn out catastrophically. So I fear that this will go the way of history. And if it doesn't, it won't be because we were complacent or we took it for granted. We just said war couldn't happen. It'll be because statesmen uh, reach beyond history as usual, beyond diplomacy as usual, beyond strategic imagination as usual. So they have to stretch to some you know, better ideas. And I think that's why it's a good thing to have conferences like this where folks who are your age are more likely to be less uh, constrained by the concepts and practices that people of my generation have, may be able to think of some better ideas. So I would say over to you, yeah. Thank you, Professor Ellison. Dr. Wang? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, uh, Graham that, uh, you know, so we, we really have to avoid this uh, this trap and, uh, and really not uh, let a catastrophic uh, uh, outcome. I think, you know, uh, from now to the, to the next 50 years, we really has to be, it's the wisdom of human being, uh, uh, humankind is really at the test. I think now with the modern technology, with, with the global village, we're now actually in the, in the same uh, uh, boat as, as I was talking to Kishu Mahobani, he was saying there's an ocean, there's 193 cabinet rather than 193 boats floating around separately. We are actually you know, in the same boat. So, so how, how can we get the, the, the boat culture you know, with this modern technology, modern integration so that we can accept each other? That's really, I think, the, a huge ta task in the future, you know, about uh, acceptance. I mean, uh, you know, things like uh, we have the idea of a democracy. We both had uh, events on democracy in, in Washington and Beijing, but how we can see the effectiveness of democracy. We also now practice uh, human rights, but let's see, can we attach human rights to the SDG 17 uh, criteria to match the human rights? So, so you know, I think it will be con con some kind of conversion of, of the values, I think, in the next 50 years so we can avoid a conflict. And, I, and also again, that uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Joseph Nye just at the same time last year. He was saying by 2035, maybe China and US will, will reach a new equilibrium and then maybe we will see some uh, common uh, uh, understanding. And, and probably by 2049, you know, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, Fukuyama, you know, this end of history may not be ending and we really can find a way to commonly live with each other and uh, understand each other because of the modern technology so much tied everybody together, we got to come up with a global culture that that recognizable by, by, by all the countries so that we don't go to the war uh, to really to make our difference. So, so I really think uh, that prosperity, uh, the, the modern <laughs> modernization and, uh, you know, can change the human being nature somehow that we really can live, uh, you know, together in the next uh, next half a century. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wan. And with on that high note, we end our conference today, uh, but still still tuning in to our future sessions. We, we want to extend our utmost appreciation to both Professor Graham Ellison, Dr. Wang Huiyao for being our panelists today. And thank you for joining us here. Uh, have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>